welcome to the Backup Podcast, a show on how technology is changing the way we live and do business. I'm your host, Ioannis Bak Bakayanis. Backup is ready to start. Hello, hello, hello. This is episode 13 of the Backup Podcast. In this episode, I have the opportunity to host a rock star of the machine learning operations world. He is very entrepreneurial and innovative spirit and that showed early in his career when he founded a company just to serve internet to his campus. His greatest creation yet is Fist, an open source feature store for machine learning. Currently, he is working as a tech lead at Tecton AI, who are the core contributor, contributors of Fist. He is Willem Pianar. Willem, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, the pleasure is definitely mine. Uh, your resume is very impressive, but again, one thing stands out and I believe it's a frequent topic of discussion. What drove you to found a company just to serve internet to university campus? Can you tell us the story behind it? Yeah, I can give you the story. I think at the time it wasn't so glamorous and I guess it's not super glamorous, but looking back, it is kind of funny. So I, I had to put myself through university. I didn't really have enough money to, you know, pay for that. And at the time I was a student there putting myself through, you know, just on like part-time jobs. And I was living in like a building where, um, you know, all these students needed internet inside of the building and you know, the building is outside as well because they come in for university and they go home on holidays. They don't want to have long-term contracts. And so I just started selling Wi-Fi that I had in my apartment, you know, temporarily to those students to as like a side gig and um, before you knew it I had like 15 to 20 people just buying internet like wi-fi like you know 500 meg at a time it was like you know you're, you're like the guy with the jacket that <laughs> opens up his jacket and then he's like okay you want a package you know I've got some package underground <laughs> um, because there was like an official university internet you could buy and it was just like lock you down on like these long-term expensive contracts and so that be I quickly realized that there was something there and it was like a massive problem in the whole campus town. I think there's about 50,000 people that live there. It's not just students. Um, and so over the course of about five or six years, we expanded that. So we literally built like towers on mountains. Um, like that was me on like climbing up on those towers, like bootstrapping these antenna antennas um, to expand our network. and. You know, we had a very, very big coverage and uh, hundreds of clients um, after five years. Uh, but it was, you know, it was a long slog and we didn't really have funding. So it was, you know, you need to use your uh, cash flow to build infrastructure. And so you're, you're always broke, but you want to put money into the business and then build out infrastructure because you're going to make money in the future. Um, but it was a lot of learning, you know, it was just a great, a great time. Uh, but it was very tough because I was doing like a full-time engineering degree as well as working. Um, so whatever I do right now, uh, so I sold that company, um, you know, after th those five years. Um, but whatever I do now at, in tech is like it, nothing compared to how difficult that was because it's like two full-time jobs. Uh, but yeah, it was lots of fun. Yeah, I could imagine. I also had a job during university, but it wasn't as difficult as that one. Uh, from what I'm hearing, uh, you started this endeavor in an uh, ad hoc manner, uh, but soon you realized that you had a solid business case in your hands. Did the same mindset spark the birth of, of Feast? Did that innovative spirit led to create uh, Feast as an open source feature store? Uh, yeah, to some degree. I think the one difference is that it's not, uh, the one is internal tooling and the other one is kind of B2C. So you had all these people telling you and you yourself having that problem and, but that's slightly different, but in some senses it's, there's a problem that needs to be solved and there's no solution for it and, or no solution in the market for it. We have to prepare, either build a solution um, or I guess just wait. And so we, in, in both cases, I tried to build a solution or find some solution myself with what was available and at the time for at Gojek, where I led or started and led the ML platform team, there really wasn't a solution for feature stores. And even if you look today, Feast, what we ended up building is a solution, but you know, there's a wide variety of use cases. And if you, I think you're working in marketing, 
the diversity of ML use cases is so wide that there's not a complete coverage of all feature stores and use cases yet. Um, so at the time, we identified a major opportunity to build a system, but we were completely focused on our own problems. We'd run into a lot of balls, and we just wanted to solve those problems. And so we looked at what options existed, and we looked at like Michelangelo and some of these other projects, and th the seed was planted to build a feature store. Is that the largest project uh, of, uh, of your life to date? Uh, well, definitely the most public facing, but I wouldn't say it was the one, well, it, I guess it is the largest at Gojek, but you know, in aggregate, it's it's like a 30% of my work when Gojek was towards Feast, yeah. We are talking about feature stores, but even the machine learning practitioners that listen to the podcast might not exactly know what a feature store is. Uh, most technology people are aware of databases, SQL, NoSQL, but most people are not aware of feature stores. What defines and differentiates uh, feature stores from other storage mediums? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something that's often uh, very hard for us to articulate because people have a preconceived notion about what a feature store is. For me, a feature store is a opinionated um, or it's a a purpose-built data system for machine learning, and it is a operational system. The feature store is a bridge between the data engineering world and the production machine learning world. So on the one side, it allows uh, users, data scientists or ML practitioners to create or um, connect data sources and publish them into a central st store, quote unquote. Um, which is a system which can then um, allow those data points to be served either for training or for you know, an online case scoring in a production environment. And so a key thing that this feature store provides is that bridge between those two worlds. And so if you just have a big query and you only do batch use cases, you can argue that that's a feature store, but a big query is, or a data warehouse is not going to have you give you online serving. The BigQuery also doesn't have a consistent interface between training and serving that is ML centric. So feature stores, in my opinion, must give you a, a model centric view of data in order to, you know, the one requirement that a model has is that it needs the same features for training and serving. But data systems don't provide that by default because they're lowest common denominator and they address multiple use cases. So feature stores give you that consistent point in time view um, of features. Uh, whether you're training or serving. So I think there's two dimensions there. There is the data and ML split, and that that on the one side, you're creating data points and producing them to the feature store and consuming them from the other side. Oh, from the other side. But then there's also the training serving split, and feature, the feature store provides that bridge as well. So that's a bit of an abstract answer, but I can dive into the more specific functionality that feature stores provide, but I think that's that's my answer, yeah. No, this is great, and we are going to dive in all that later. Uh, definitely online data are very important for machine learning use cases. Uh, when we say online data, we mean data that are produced and captured real time. For example, Google's uh, autocomplete feature, when we type something on the search bar, is a machine learning product that uses online data as we type. In that sense, uh, how essential do you think feature stores are to uh, machine learning first organizations? Could they survive without a feature store in the future? Oh, that's a very good question. I think um, it really depends on the organization and the scale they're working on. Most organizations, I'd say, um, look, if you're saying they're ML first, presumably yeah. they're doing things at more scale, right? That's that's a different group. And I think most organizations aren't ML first. Um, so I think if you just want to ship one model into production and it's not business critical and it's maybe just you know supplementary info for a user, then you don't really need a feature store. Whenever, if you're ML first, whenever you want to iterate on many features, many models, or you have many use cases, and especially if you have a um, heterogeneous uh, data landscape, like you have streaming data, you have RPC data, you have batch data, you have real-time computed on-demand features, and you have all those things and they're all feeding into models, Not ha you're going to build a feature store. Um, you might just not call it that. It might just be that 
that logic is scattered through a bunch of like applications and scripts and things. Um, but, but the same problems will need to be solved somehow. So for us, a feature store is just, it's a collection of that kind of, uh, you know, abstractions and, and boilerplate consolidated in a single system instead of spread out across, you know, your model serving layer and your ETL pipelines and your ML pipelines. We just encapsulate some of that reusable logic for you. Um, so I think of, I think a feature store is going to be is going to be critical for ML first companies, and it may be the case that there's no one size fits all feature store that addresses them all. There might be more vertical specific feature stores like oh there's the the specific pattern for marketing and the specific pattern for fraud detection etc. We it's not clear that that is necessarily the case. I think for Feast we believe that we can provide us solution that you know provide uh, that addresses most use cases um, but I think it's going to be strategically super important um, because this you know fundamentally the feature store sits in a very strategic location for the organization it's the pl it's the thing that allows a data scientist to add new value into the org they can create new data and feed that to the model and we're all assuming that data is the key thing that drives performance of models right um, to some degree also the model, but you know, to a large degree it's the data. Yeah. They can create new data and then on the other side, the engineers can operate the feature store to prevent downtime, to monitor drift, um, to, to make sure that the performance of training is there, to you know, latencies are low enough, throughput high enough. Um, so there's the positive and negative engineering. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with those terms, but the one's creating value and the other one is avoiding the loss of value. That the feature store enables yeah that was a very insightful answer i did not have that question in my mind but it's part midway your answer uh it is apparent to me that the value of the feature store increases exponentially with the volume of the, of the data that uh being passed through uh this might lead me to believe that feature store is designed for large enterprises but at the same time, when I'm uh, speaking about uh, machine learning first organizations, I'm thinking of startups. Startups are more likely to adopt uh, a machine learning first mentality because of their narrow scope. And uh, since they don't have massive uh, technical debt or legacy system to create uh, friction uh, around machine learning development. Who do you think benefits more from the adoption of feature stores? Who will get more value out of it in time? Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating angle. Uh, typically in startups, I've, there's two kinds of startups, right? There's the ones building tools, and there's the ones that are actually solving some kind of different problem. Perhaps, you know, if they're if they're producing new data, then they want to have data scientists and maybe ML engineers. But I, I, we've seen less of them. More, normally the startups are, they're happy to just hack something together to get to tomorrow. They just want to see the next round and they just get to the next stage. And then at a certain point, they're happy to clear tech debt and you know, accept that they need to build more structure. So there are startups that have been adopting feature stores and feast, um, you know, heavily, but um, I'd say that they're a smaller group than a small team within a larger company, um, let's say a fraud prevention team or marketing or some kind of ML team, you know, they, they can plan a little bit ahead and they can implement a system like a feature store in order to address, um, you know, they can see in the horizon that if they don't have a feature store that they're going to run into problems um, scaling things or um, decentralizing, institutionalizing a lot of their knowledge. So I, I'd say that the second group is more commonly the ones that we see um, jumping for, for feature stores. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. I wouldn't bet on it. Uh, what do you think that is that? Okay. So interestingly, I, I want to, I want to hypothesize with you why that is the case. There aren't many open source feature stores right now. And so these folks can only choose from open source. Um, if you're a startup, you obviously don't want to spend too much money. I mean, there are proprietary feature stores. Um, Feature stores like Feast and some of the other open source ones that I won't name um, 
are traditionally heavyweight infrastructure and you need engineers to maintain and deploy them, right? And so one of the things that we've been hearing a lot from our users is, you know, I'd love to use Feast, but I just I just don't have engineers to manage it right now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna think about it, but maybe next time. And so our newest release, we're really focusing on making it super easy for teams to just get started on it and then grow, like scale it up over time. Um, so we believe when, when our next release comes out in 0 0.10, it's in April, that we'll see more adoption at startups and teams that they just want to solve a specific business problem. That's it. Great. Before I get into my novice personal experience with Fist in, on my home server here, I would like you to walk us through the product. Up until now, we were talking generally about feature stores, but I would like to dive uh, deeper into your product. Um, where does um, Fist sit in the feature store world? Uh, what differentiates it from other feature stores? Well, of course, it's uh, uh, an open source uh, software, which is different than other enterprise solutions. But uh, what is Fist's goal? and your vision for the project? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we originally started off, so the work we did with Feast was a collaboration between Google and Gojek. So we built and designed and built it together. Our original scope was we wanted to make features a, or a centralized place for users to create features, discover features, reuse those features, and expose those features to models for training and serving. Um, and then we wanted to provide some guarantees of performance for training and performance for serving um, and a kind of a consistent interface between uh, in those environments. What we realized at some point was that if you include the training story, the scope of this project becomes unbounded almost. Sorry, not the training, the transformation story, like aggregations and actual feature engineering. And at Gojek, we had systems that already did that. And so an intentional and a slightly controversial decision we made, design principle, was not to include wholesale ETL or ELT transformations as a part of Feast. And so one of the things that we don't, I wouldn't say that we are never going to do, but we're not going to do soon is, you know, make Feast a Dagster or a Prefect or a DBT and make that device where you author your features. Mm -hmm. So really the key thing that the featured Feast does is it provides a way for you to abstract your models from your data and so you deploy a feast and you'd have all of these data sources and we're going to add support for more and more sources. Um, and it decouples you. So you, essentially when you're training your model, you can you can save that binary to MLflow or your, art, your artifact store with a list of features and that model is portable. You can deploy it and run it in any environment where that feature store is exposed. And so all you need is a list of features and then you can retrieve those features from the feature store, whether for training or for serving. So it's environment and context agnostic. Um, and so, so that decoupling is the one thing. Feast deals with the ingestion of data from these sources, the persistence, so uh, the storage of that data, and then you know building those training data sets and serving. And it also provides you with point in time guarantees. So if you're reading feature values in the online store, you're always going to get the freshest data for your models. And if you have, uh, if you're training a model, it's going to give you a representative point in time view, you know, at each one of those instances or examples for your model um, throughout the history for training. Um, and so those guarantees are why people use it. And of course we have other things like we produce metrics, right? So if you're, you know, hitting your serving API for features, we push out metrics to your production systems like Prometheus and StatsD and Stackdriver. Um, during ingestion, we do the same. Um, we're busy integrating data quality and validation tooling as well. So it's really the operational aspect where we started as an engineering team in Gojek, um, solving some, you know, solving the problems of how do we expose a lot of data that data scientists are creating to production systems in a safe, reliable way at scale. So I'd say that's the area that Feast focuses on the most. It's not the developer workflows or creation of new features. That's a weak spot we have. We're working backwards and we're working towards the, the data science flows and we're trying to integrate ourselves into those flows so that it's easy for you to author a new feature and publish it through Feast. And there is that strong connection between what you've authored upstream to what is inside of the feature store. Yeah. 
So if you look at like a Tekton, uh, my current employer, which is, has its own feature store, and that's a proprietary software, it's very similar, but they have a superset of the functionality. So they have really nailed the, or Tekton, we've nailed the discovery. There's a UI where you've got a catalog of features and you can browse them. So from a reuse standpoint, that's great. Also, from an authoring standpoint, you're creating transformations. You're creating SQL or PySpark, and you're publishing those as functions. And when you run a, an apply command, it will declaratively provision all of the jobs to compute those features for you and then push them into the correct online store or, or offline store, make them available. So it really it completes that upstream part of transforming the features and making them ready for consumption. Um, so that's something that is that is a much larger scope project, and that's not something that we built in, in Feast. Um, and you really require 10 to 15 engineers to do that properly. Um, and you know we're just scratching the surface right now, and I think we're going to have need a lot more engineers. <laughs> <laughs> you actually covered my next question as well, uh, because uh, feature engineering is a big part of uh, a machine learning practitioners' diet. Uh, and by feature, uh, for the non-technical listeners, um, we mean a variable, a signal that could be used by a machine learning model to make a prediction. Some features are simple, like uh, date temperature, and some others are extremely co complex, uh, like, uh, for example, credit, credit scores. Uh, and one constant effort of the machine learning tooling out there is to reduce the time that teams uh, spend on feature engineering. Uh, Willem, how uh, how do you think uh, Feast uh, is contributing towards that goal? I think if you look at, uh, well, from a feature engineering standpoint, what is the life cycle? Like, is it getting that feature into production and actually consumed by that production system? Then yes, we are definitely. Um, you know, it depends on the team. Like, some teams don't struggle with that part, and some teams they can create their you know, features and pandas in the notebook and never get into prod. So by essentially we are short circuiting the engineers, like we're giving the data scientists the back door into production using the feature store. And I think that's, that's what was really powerful for us at Gojek. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, and especially, uh, the, the thing that, uh, as you said, we create a feature that, uh, is used in a Jupyter notebook and one, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in one model of the hundreds that we that we could run, and that feature is never used by by anyone. It's not even visible by anybody else, right? Yeah. So it's 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 been uh, in or if maybe even if, even a binning of the variables could be very powerful for the machine learning teams and maybe uh, across teams that could share variables like that. Uh, also, from a scoring perspective. To be able to seamlessly go from uh, experimentation to running in production in any setting with only a requirement uh, with only the requirement of feast is incredible in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, I think it's uh, you know for our teams it was you always you often want to be able to know, create a model locally and train it and see the metrics. But for many models, we need to go into prod and actually get user traffic on it, even if it's 1% or 2% of traffic. But many organizations, and I, I, Gojek is not alone, and you know, I've spoken to so many other teams as well, they haven't matured to the point of understanding the nuances with data science and building ML systems. So there are a lot of organizational hurdles to cross there and shipping data into production. Often, you know, you have a warehouse where it's a big mess and it's, there's no staging prod and dev, there's just the warehouse. And there's so many things that, you know, the production engineering team will just say to you, we, 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 are, we don't have any control over the data there. We can't let you ship that into production. So if you can provide a system that's gives the production teams a little bit more confidence in what you're shipping and you know, add some guardrails there. You overcome organizational challenges with a feature store that weren't easy to, for data scientists to overcome before. And you know it allows data scientists to ship sometimes bad data, sometimes just crappy data into prod and see what happens. We want to give them those loops 
maybe it's not a super tight loop that's all in their notebooks to start we'll get there but we want to give them a way to iterate that doesn't just involve like synthetic local training runs but you know actually pushing a model and seeing what happens and then pulling it out if it doesn't work well couldn't agree more another thing that many teams fail to understand in the past and some still today is that the models cannot be considered a separate entity from the data they have been trained upon. Uh, the same training dataset uh, retrieval logic will, not, will yield uh, different training datasets in different times, which will affect the model parameters and end up with different models. Um, how does Feast and feature stores in general help the ML practitioner with uh, training data validity and uh, version control? Yeah, that's a very good question. I think this one is a little bit trickier for Feast since we don't own the transformation itself. We we rely on the upstream system to publish the metadata to Feast. So our story there is quite uh, poor, I'd say, right now. And it's something that is a big part of our roadmap. It's trying to figure out how can we couple the tables within Feast, the feature definitions, to the upstream ETL or ELT systems that are producing the, the data. Um, what metadata do we have to capture there? Um, so that's something we're working on right now. And, and the, the option we have right now, or the approach most teams take, is that feature definitions are version controlled in Git. And there's a process that couples that Git repository to your, um, let's say, your ETL pipelines, or whether it's DBT or Spark or Python or whatever it is. And those tables get bumped when the versions get bumped, when those ETLs get bumped. Um, it's not super crisp right now, um, but how Tekton does this, and I think is a very elegant way, is if you do own the transformations, you allow the user to provide raw events or raw data. Um, so this, these are typically just application level events that are sunk into a, a lake or in a warehouse, and maybe some static reference data. And then all of the transformations are owned by the feature store. And then the user computes those, those transformations, and they can be layered. Um, and you build that. You can build a hash from that, right? You can build a version from the raw data copy over specific time ranges, specific transformations, and um, you know you, you know at a point in time what the model was exposed to. And if any of those inputs to the training run change, then it's a new version or it's a different model. So there's obviously some nuances there because some folks. You know, we've had a lot of discussions on what is a new model. Yeah. Is it a new model if it's just a new day? It's just a refresh. I don't want to have a new model. Um, so it, there's a bit of nuance there, but um, yeah, if, if you don't own the transformation, then it's harder to version um, the actual features. You can um, if, still, if an upstream system pushes them. Yeah, you can still version though the the training data set, right? So it, oh, I mean the training data set is versioned. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that is uh, what uh, I was talking about. Uh, generally, the, the ability to create uh, training data metadata and link them all with the data in a, in a kind of hassle-free way. Uh, yeah, so, so in Feast, you can, every time you do a training run, you build a training data set, we create a new copy, and uh, that is versioned, yeah. And I mean, that can be tied one-to-one -one with the model, yeah. Yes, uh, from uh, personal experience at least, I have uh, a deep appreciation for the ability to connect data to models, uh, which in turn gives you the power to recreate and validate those said trained models. Being able to identify and trace all the steps for a safe model that scores live data in production is crucial for robust deployments. Uh, on top of that, um, uh, one big challenge of uh, models in production is uh, training data freshness. Uh, if I post a new video in YouTube, uh, I would like to be recommended by uh, YouTube's uh, uh, recommendation engine as soon as I publish it. The more I wait uh, for the system to incorporate my video in the training data set, uh, the less relevant it becomes yes, to my definitely. potential audience. I was uh, wondering if Feast could help uh, with the case of uh, online model retraining. Well, I mean, so to be clear, there's this line that we do not cross, and that is 
the actual training. Like, of course, if you have a model that requires fresh data, we can help with that. Yeah. Um, but that's going to be a separate system. So how we can help with that is the fact that we have both batch loads as well as streaming ingestion. So we have an online store that stores the latest copies of data. It's basically Redis or Redis cluster. We'll make sure that if you've got an event stream on Kafka or you've got your data landing in BigQuery or some warehouse, we can ship that into production as well. So it really depends on where where your features are. So if somebody is posting a video that's creating an event, that event goes into some kind of bus, you might create features from that. You might transform that in a stream or in a batch warehouse. We can make sure that that operational loop is co is completed, right? Yeah. So that it goes from operations to like your analytical stack and back from your analytical stack into op operational production. Um, so then you, you'll have your model um, training, like real live training or retraining or whatever you call it. It might not even be a training. It might just need fresh features, right? It might just need to look up a bunch of new products or new new content, right? It might just be uh, uh, the same model. Um, but yeah, that is that is one of the key value props that I think we unlock, and that is a big gap in the market and that feature stores address in general. Yeah. Yeah, and as exactly as you said, I'm not, I'm not really interested in the, um, in the retraining. You might not even retrain. Yeah. This the, the availability, although yeah. the data is very important um, to be able to up um, uh, on demand uh, once they, they they got available from from um, uh, from your back end, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, that that is. Uh, I'm really fascinated about uh, uh, feature stores, um, especially open source. Uh, but uh, you you mentioned something about an April release. Um, what are you working on that release? What are the the latest and greatest for uh, for Feast? And maybe can you give us like a, a flavor of uh, what's coming up in the next release. Yeah, this is something we've, you know, I've actually wanted to do for since day one with Feast. Um, I'm going to give you the long-winded answer. I'm going to take a short story and make it a long story, oh, great. if you don't mind. Like <laughs> so basically, we started with Feast as engineers, and you know, we're happy with Kubernetes and deploying a bunch of infrastructure, solving our problems. Secretly, that actually is a bit of tech debt. Like it, you know, engineers don't always think about it like that, but. It's addictive to be able to just spin up new components and services in a cluster. Um, but sometimes you know, it's hard to go back down to the notebook level or the library level or component level. Um, so we, what we said with this new release was, could we just get away from having teams manage a platform with Feast? How could we make it like really, really simple for them to get started? And this wasn't just you know, we're just bored and we want to mix things up, spice things up. We spoke to a lot of teams and so many of them said, it's so much infrastructure. I need to manage a Postgres, a Redis, a Core, a Serving, a Spark, and I need a bucket and I need a warehouse. Where do I start? This is so much. And then what do I get? I get ingestion and serving. Yeah, it's great if I've got all these, you know, if I'm running at scale or if I have five engineers that are just sitting on their hands. But if I'm one person or two people and we just want to solve a problem, this is too much. Um, so they said, you know, we like that idea of solving these problems and we actually want to contribute back to Feast, um, but can you make it easier for us? And so we just peeled back those onion layers and thought of like, what is the essential complexity here? And the only thing we couldn't really remove was the online store. Like that, if we take that out, then, you know, there's almost nothing left, but we could make the serving layer optional, like the actual API. We could remove the compute layer, Spark. Um, we could remove the registry or move it elsewhere. Um, so basically what we did is we said, how can we, uh, how, what is the lowest rung that we can provide for a team to get onto this feature store ladder? And that rung is a SDK, CLI driven feature store. You can compare that to a Terraform or a DBT where you have infrastructure already. Let's say you've got a BigQuery, let's say you've got an online store like a Redis, a Bigtable, a Dynamo, Firestore, something, right? This SDK takes feature definitions, like just some YAML files or Python files that you define, and it will configure your infrastructure in such a way that you can execute these 
um, feature store um, you know, functionalities or flows as we call them. So you can ship data from your offline store into your online store. You can build training data sets or you can look up um, online feature values from a store and it'll organize your tables for you and it'll do the schema evolution and, and garbage collection and all these things in a declarative way without needing to have an API like a core registry. We just use a file. It's just literally just a, a protobufs that we store in your local file system or in a bucket. Without having an online store, you can just read it straight from the online, like the actual database. I mean, you, you still have the option to deploy the API if you're a platform team, but if you're just a one-man shop, you can just use the Python client and read it straight from the online store. You don't need to run Spark. We've, you know, we're going to use distributed or we're going to use on-node compute in order to do this ingestion so that you don't need to deploy a Spark cluster in order to just use Feast. And we're going to try and leverage managed services in order to integrate streams. So. We think that, so, so the difference between these two approaches is literally, you know, maintaining a whole platform and a cluster and having to dedicate engineers compared to, you can get a, a feature store up and running in let's say 20 seconds, like literally 20 seconds. And it's going to cost you no effort to manage that. It, you, it's, it's, it's like dead easy to, to just use. And I think something that's very important to know here is that this is a, this is not really a the functionality change for Feast, we we scaled it back down at this point instead of investing into new functionality because we don't think that if once we go down this road of adding a bunch of new functionality, we'll never be able to have this opportunity to scale it back down to this level. So now that we're at this level, we've got a new constraint like an environment we execute in and the mode, which is an SDK CLI driven one, then we're going to layer on all the functionality we need, whether it's data validation, whether it's versioning, whether it's, you know, better workflows for data scientists to author new features, even if it's transformations, all those things. Um, but, you know, we want to make it super lightweight. We want to make it as easy as like an ML flow or a pandas or something like that to just use it. Yeah, that, that's, that's incredible. So you treat it down to, to skeleton, you kept the heart of the, of the whole project. And then you said, look, uh, uh, can give you this bare functionality that is the what we believe the essence of uh, feature store or and um, uh, what we believe that it should be doing uh, day one. It started, uh, but it's it's not constrained that they, they if the team is big, big and they want to um, uh, on top of it that they not they can add yeah. the functionality as as they need to right. Yeah, so we're going to make it possible for you to continue to use, for example, our online APIs. Like you can run a Redis cluster, you can use your serving API. It's going to be 100% compatible. Um, and yeah, so from a scalability perspective, we don't want to stand in your way. Like you can even use Spark. Like we've built the Spark launchers and ingestion layers and streaming and all that stuff. You, we want you to be able to use that if you if you choose to. It's just we don't want to force you to use that. <laughs> Great, um, and uh, I, I think the feast is uh, uh, the unofficial or the official uh, feature store for Kubeflow. Uh, did uh, any uh, first of all, could you share how, how that happened? Uh, how excited are you for that uh, to happen? And uh, also, did did that uh, uh, choice? Did it affect your your uh, your style of because I uh, from my experience Kubeflow is is kind of like that it gives you the the, uh, the opportunity to do different things and run as um, is is give you a, gu a guideline and then okay you can choose and pick whatever you you run on. Yeah, we don't. So I'm not really a big advocate for the Kubeflow approach. I think. You know, it's hard, right? Because you're trying to address many different users. There's platform users, there's the end users that are using the platform. Um, it's, you, you want to provide cookie cutter, uh, you know, a, a one size fits all. Um, but in almost all cases, what that we've seen with Kubeflow is um, teams either need to highly customize it for their use case or they end up using a subset of the functionality. And so they've never really nailed the, you know, I can just install Kubeflow and get up and running. There's always some plus plus. There's something something you need to do. Um, we want to make Feast, 
you know, just we don't really follow that methodology. We want to be very opinionated and have a lot of conventions and you just like start and it should just be intuitive how you can use it. We're not there yet, but it's something that we're really, really focused on. And I think we'll get there, especially with this new approach that we're taking. I think it's interesting that you brought up Kubeflow because you, a lot of the discussions on the Kubeflow side pull towards a heavy infra platform-based approach. And it's a little bit uh, going against the grain to go you know, down a level to CLIs or SDKs or notebook driven flows. Um, you know, so I, I think we're taking a slightly different approach, but it's still quite in line with, with the Kubeflow vision of providing tools that users can you know, cherry pick what they want to use. Um, but I just think, don't think that, you know, nobody in this space has really solved the, you know, how can you give somebody like a, a good convention or a good, uh, use case specific, um, toolbox. It's, it's a bit of like a buffet in some senses. Yeah. And, uh, um, even, um, uh, uh, companies like, uh, they have their own, uh, Google, Amazon and uh uber um they, they i don't think if they have solved that they would they would have made it well they're trying to do it with the the, the their cloud solution but if they if somebody solved it uh through and through they would have another product in the line that they would that it would be yeah they'll exactly well they right. will they'll compete with themselves <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. No, I think I think it's possible. I mean, if you look at like yeah, Google is also doing this, is they also have like a lot of vertical solutions, right? And you'll see the cloud providers will do this. There's vertical AI solutions, and that'll be successful to some degree. But I think that wasn't really the Qflow approach. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that is a pretty good segue, though, to um, and to mention and you we cut that up on uh, during our talk that um, uh, Feast is supported by Tekton AI, and you work for for Tekton AI, and Tekton is a, a for-profit startup with. Lots and lots of funding and uh, uh, and uh, and customers, and uh, they they provide the feature store options for enterprises, and that is really cool to me that uh, a company instead of competing with an open, uh, say okay let's collaborate together, and maybe we can uh, solve different problems or solve the same problem from different approaches. Uh, how this came to be and how did you make this thing? Yeah, it's definitely quite unconventional if you look at like previous companies that have done this, they've both open source themselves and then built a kind of managed offering from that. In this case, it was mostly a matter of um, Tekton has a lot of folks that have, you know, they coined the term feature store. They built their first feature store at Uber, you know, the Kevin and Mike, um, the founders. Um, and they have a lot of people that have been just focusing heavily on feature stores and building the best in class feature store. And, on the open source side, we've been doing the same thing with Kojak, right? We've been really focused on this problem and um, really trying to build the ideal best, you know, feature store. Um, so it felt like a natural fit to put our heads together and work towards a single goal instead of, you know, di dividing our attention. Um, the road towards that dream state, that utopia, is one that we're figuring out still. You know, for us right now, our vision is to build a unified. API between both of these products. Um, but right now we are just focused dogmatically and solely on how can we just solve users' problems, whether those are enterprises like large corporates or banks, or those are just like a single data scientist. That's our number one focus. And then a secondary focus is how can we make sure that you know we, we build towards one vision. But internally, you know, it's a flurry of designs and conversations around use cases and problems and abstractions. Um, I think in, something that I really appreciate is just there's no notion of building j just a company that is going to make some money, right? We really want to nail this problem space. We really want to figure out, we want to build that ideal feature store. We really believe in this, this, this mission. Um, and we think in the next couple of years, it's going to be table stakes. Like you're going to start a company, build your data platform, but when you switch over to ML, you're going to implement your feature store. So it's going to be some fundamental, like a cornerstone of your ML strategy. Um, so we, we're building for those teams. We're, we're shooting for those for the next couple of years. Yeah. 
That is amazing. That is amazing. We wish the best to to Willem, to Tekton AI, to the Feast Project. Uh, that was great. Um, thank you so much, Willem, for coming to the show and helping me back us up. Cool. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. It was awesome. Thank you. This is it. Your mind is now backed up. To learn more about the topics discussed or the guests, follow the links in the description. Now you have the chance to subscribe, rate, like, dislike, and review the show. Also, looking forward to hearing your thoughts in the comments. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me and see you next time.